I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, the biggest reason I'm making this review is in response to a different review I saw. Back in 2017, as Katie and I were preparing to let's play Picklet's Big Game, I was looking around to find some gameplay footage to refresh myself in the game. I ended up stumbling across a specific review of the game, and this review was honestly one of the most cringeworthy videos I've ever sat through. I can certainly forgive stilted deliveries and awkward jokes that don't really go anywhere, since it was the creator's first review, and you've got to start somewhere. But what rubbed me the wrong way was how this reviewer was trying to portray Picklet's Big Game as some kind of disaster, something laughably bad, akin to the likes of I Join the Click, America's Next Top Model, or Sonic and the Secret Rings. To make matters worse, this review spent its first few minutes talking about Battle for Bikini Bottom and how much better it was than Piglet's Big Game. Meanwhile, I'm just sitting there listening to this review like, dude, come on. Have you played Battle for Bikini Bottom recently? It's far from perfect. Like, don't get me wrong, Battle for Bikini Bottom is by no means a bad game. As far as licensed games go, it's really one of the best. I hold fond memories of it, and if I had to give it a review score, I'd probably award it around an 8 out of 10. But the thing is, that's also about the same score I'd give to Picklet's Big Game. It was very clear to me that this reviewer wasn't really interested in seeing what Picklet's Big Game had to offer, and was instead just looking to get some cheap laughs by shitting all over an obscure game. To which I have to say, if you're looking to shit on a game, make sure it's actually a shit-worthy game. Pets Cats 2 exists, and it's far from the only game of its ilk out there. I don't want to name any names here, since I really don't want anyone to go harassing this guy or anything, but it's not too hard to find this review if you'd like to see it for yourself. Something tells me that this dude is a pretty big fan of the GameCube. Anyway. Is Piglet's Big Game a mind-blowing masterpiece that will entirely restructure your view on licensed games? God no, this isn't Monog or anything. But it is a solid A-tier game that had a lot of imagination put into it, and the team's efforts clearly show. Hello everyone, my name is Fabulous Fish, and welcome to the Fishbowl. <laughs> Piglet's Big Game is kind of an anomaly in its existence. Given its title, it's safe to assume that the game is based on Piglet's Big Movie, which released the same year in theaters. Despite this, the name and the logo are just about the only things that this game shares in common with the film. Piglet's Big Game was developed by Doki Denki Studio, which hasn't really made anything else a particular note. Piglet's Big Game is a very simple game, aimed at young audiences. The gameplay is easy to understand and the graphics are very bright and colorful. Truthfully, Piglet really doesn't offer quite as much in the way of mechanics as a game like Battle for Bikini Bottom does. But what it lacks in mechanical depth, it more than makes up for with its brilliant new of atmosphere, conveyed to the player in a very natural, immersive manner. Just how does Piglet's Big Game manage to shine where so many other games, both licensed and original, have failed? Just sit back and we'll find out. <laughs> I think that presentation is probably the hardest part of a game to describe in words. At its core, presentation is the way a game presents itself, as in what it conveys to the player through stylistic choices found in its visual direction, sound direction, controls and animations, and how it conveys its storyline. When you first boot up the game, you're greeted with the title screen, and yeah, this is probably the worst part of the game's presentation right here. It's just his ass! Why the fuck is the title screen just Piglet's ass? Luckily, from here, things are pretty much just going to improve. I said pretty much. Progressing past the screen starts the opening cutscene, and the CGI looks really good considering that this is an obscure game by a no-name dev released in 2003. You have to remember, its main competition looked like this, or this, or even this. Ugh. This cutscene features the current at the time voice cast of Winnie the Pooh, who did a good job trying to match the iconic performances of the original cast while also bringing their own unique interpretations of the characters to the table. Pooh still sounds absent-minded, Tigger sounds hyper as ever, and Rabbit sounds just like a cocaine addict who's panicking because they can't reach their usual dealer through all the quarantine. My carrots! My carrots! <laughs> Throughout the scene, Piglet walks down a path in the Hundred Acre Wood, and the narrator describes what all his friends are up to. At the end of the path, Piglet is confronted by a dark shadow, which he refers to as a Granosaurus? Granosaurus! Granosaurus! Even though it doesn't look especially dinosaur-like to me, no one else seems to be able to see it. But Piglet runs off and bumps into Christopher Robin, who gives him some generic advice about facing his fears and believing himself. To overcome a fear, you just have to stare it down. Believe in yourself, Piglet. <laughs> I wish it were that easy. This sets up the plot for the game, as it's all about Piglet's growth as he learns to become braver. Similarly, throughout the game, you are sort of helping everyone with the different problems they've been experiencing in this opening cutscene. Sort of. I'll explain more in a minute. From here, we're dumped into the main menu, and I've gotta say that this is one of the most creative main menus I've ever seen. I love how the player actually gets to control and manipulate Piglet in-engine for this menu. It's similar to the main menu for Super Mario Sunshine, except a lot more involved. In addition to be able to walk around to all the different options, each option is accompanied by a cute set piece that helps visualize its meaning, which is a great way to explain how they work to a younger player. The volume control is represented by differently sized frogs croaking, mono versus stereo output is represented by groups of record players, and the controller vibration is visualized with whatever this thing is humping the ground. 
Additionally, this menu allows for a safe environment where the player can experiment with the controls and a few of the mechanics. Players can push a box around, get a feel for how they move, and experiment with this game's chase AI by attempting to catch these frogs scattered about. The whole setup is very charming and feels very clever. Whenever the player feels that they're ready to tackle the game Should proper, they can look through this telescope to spy on their friends as they sleep. Creeper. From here, Piglet gains the ability to enter their dreams? Wait, what? Yes, somehow, with no explanation, Piglet just walks up to this telescope and gains the ability to infiltrate the dreams of his friends in the Hundred Acre Woods, a la Inception, where he sets out to help them solve the problems that they were unable to solve in the real world's opening cutscene. And Piglet just doesn't react to this newfound superpower? He's just kind of standing there, like- Yeah, what you expect? It's a low budget kids game you think they thought to shit through? Look, if you came to this game for its story, you're probably going to be disappointed. The main reason this telescope exists is that the developers had an excuse to design these really intricate, surreal dream worlds, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. Surreal really is the only way to describe the levels in this game. Each dream world has a unique aesthetic to it, themed around the character who's dreaming it, and they're all really imaginative and memorable. Pooh's dream is made up entirely of candies and sweets, which is fitting as you try to help him fill up a pot of delicious honey. Rude Pooh's dream is made out of cardboard and paper, colored in by crayon, which suits a child's mind well as you help him to get back his lost ball. Owl's dream is… weird. It features a lot of large-scale books and office supplies as you go on a quest to help Owl retrieve his memory book. Eeyore's dream consists of a realistic gothic aesthetic with dulled colors, often on a grayscale, which makes sense as you're helping him to restore the colors to his depressing world. Tigger's dream also features a realistic aesthetic with stripes on the trees, but I appreciate how each of the corners of the map represent a different season as you help him hunt down his missing stripes since he accidentally painted himself orange in a cutscene. The odd one out here is Rabbit, whose dream features a pretty down-to-earth visual direction as you help him harvest his carrots before a big storm rolls in. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, Rabbit's dream is kinda disappointing given how interesting the other dreams are visually. That said, there's one really cool part with a garden high up in the sky, and the little train car thing near the end is pretty cute. But overall, I find Rabbit's dream to be the least memorable visually. As one last thing to add to the presentation, Piglet's big game features a narrator, who has a unique quote for every single inventory item, of which there are a lot, as well as interactive item in the game's world. Piglet wanted very much to catch the ball of color, Bobby in the fountain. He would first need to stop the water from bubbling. But how? If you haven't seen The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh recently, which I'd highly recommend because that movie's fucking awesome, the narrator is one of the best parts of the film, often offering various fourth wall jokes and making sarcastic comments about the characters and events. Everything he says just sounds slightly condescending, and it's really charming. This carries over into the game as well, where it almost seems like the narrator is making fun of you at points. Now Piglet looked at this rather odd object, asking himself what it could be. And as he looked, it came to him. It was a hook. All of this works together for one common goal of creating a very cute and pleasing atmosphere through this game's presentation. With presentation alone, Piglet's Big Game creates more of an atmosphere than most cheap games do in their entirety, and we haven't even talked about the game itself yet. So how does this game actually work? <laughs> Although this is a strong foundation, Piglet's Big Game still wouldn't be particularly noteworthy if the game had nothing else to go off of after you got past the initial spectacle. This is where the game's level design comes into play, and it has a surprising amount going for it for such a low-profile title. In a lot of ways, the level design in Piglet's Big Game reminds me of Scooby-Doo and Night 100 Frights. Both games feature worlds made up of interconnected rooms separated by loading screens. Rooms often have multiple entrances, and occasionally can be visited in a slightly non-linear order, creating a bit of a maze in each dream level. Also like in Night 100 Frights, the paths in Piglet's Big Game will often lead the player to a roadblock or a dead end, causing the player to have to backtrack in the level or return later to solve a puzzle, either by triggering something in another room or with a new ability. <laughs> Unlike Night of 100 Frights, however, new abilities are not upgrades to Piglet's moveset and instead take the form of temporary inventory items, like in a point-and-click adventure game. When entering a new room in Piglet's Big Game, the player will iterate through three distinct steps. The first of these steps doesn't always occur, so we'll come back to that one later. The second step, then, is to explore the room. This is usually the longest of the three steps, and is also the most rewarding. In this step, the player is tasked with collecting cookies, which act as this game's currency. What is it with these low-budget games and using food items as payment? Cookies are not found lying throughout the level, however, and instead must be gathered by interacting with various objects in a room, causing them to shake and making the cookies fly out using this little kick. <laughs> I just find something about the idea of Piglet throwing a kick to be so ridiculous. Maybe it's the way he grunts every time he kicks, or maybe it's just how awkwardly low power it feels, but whatever it is, I crack up every time I see it. Look out, world! Piglet's coming and he's got a bone to pick with your shins! Each dream has a finite number of cookies in it, and the cookies are always in consistent locations. Cookies spawn in a group of five, and as a nice touch, the pitch of the sound effect that plays when you collect each one will go up as you collect consecutive cookies from a group, similar to the red coins in Super Mario 64. Despite what a certain other reviewer says about this game, I feel that the cookies are seldom too hard to find. Most of the time, objects of interest will stick out or in other ways make themselves look conspicuous. Anyone who's played a video game before will probably have a good eye for which objects in a room will contain cookies, and new gamers will quickly learn the patterns which will carry over into different games altogether. Additionally, it's never required that a player collect all the cookies in a room to progress, with the exception of a single room in Rue's dream, which is concise enough that this isn't a difficult task. Actually, I find it a little disappointing that there isn't a reward for collecting all the cookies in the game, with the exception of a brief cutscene that plays after clearing a room of cooks.
With collecting these cookies comes my biggest issue with the game, and that is the cookies spawn time limit. After only a mere few seconds, cookies will retreat back into the object they spawn from, causing you to have to shake it again. This can get very tedious very fast, especially given the awkward angles the cookies can bounce at sometimes. Luckily, the game allows you to keep the cookies you've collected, but this one aspect can get pretty frustrating. After collecting all the cookies, you get to move into the third step of gameplay, and that is interacting with objects and characters in each room. Oftentimes, speaking with characters will just give the player hints on where to go or what to do. A bit of water could be the solution. But this occasionally triggers a longer cutscene or gives the player a new item. Most rooms instead require the player to interact with objects, which can be further broken down into working with inventory items, solving a puzzle, or performing a quick challenge. Challenges usually consist of a race against the clock, either to perform a series of actions in the correct order before time runs out or to chase down a runaway object, which may or may not be on a time limit. <laughs> That's a little creepy. The timelines in this game are kind of brutal. They remind me a lot of the Master Thief sprints in Sly Cooper with just how unforgiving they are. The player just barely has enough time to complete most tasks, and this can sometimes take a small amount of trial and error. Adding to the intensity is the quick paced music, which leaves the player's heart pounding. I'm normally against trial and error in games, but these segments are small enough to not get too frustrating, and the punishment for failure is always just to reset the room and start the trial over. The feeling of racing against the end of the clock is exhilarating, and it's immensely satisfying to complete these tasks. As these kinds of challenges are Require quick navigation of the room, this is greatly rewarding to a player who paid attention to the room's layout during the cookie collecting phase. The chase AI can be just a little more frustrating as they move very fast and usually do a really good job of being as far away from the player as possible. With a little bit of planning, the player can corner their targets against walls and objects, meaning that it too rewards the player for having learned the room's layout in the second phase. The second kind of room interaction is puzzle solving, which usually comes down to a simple logic puzzle. This is a game for kids after all. This can be something like matching symbols to flags on the walls, pushing boxes around in confined spaces, or manipulating the hydraulic pressure pressure and pipes, a la Mystery Mayhem. That's it. It's turned on. On the wall, Piglet noticed a flag with the symbol of a fleur de -lis. The fuck is a fleur de -lis? This kind of room interaction usually has the direct outcome of clearing a roadblock in the room or granting the player a new inventory item. As these puzzles require the player to be familiar with the room, they too reward carefully exploring during the cookie collecting phase. Sometimes, the results from this puzzle don't clear a roadblock in the current room, but rather make an alteration to a completely different room. This means that the player is rewarded not just for having explored rooms previously, but for making mental notes for items of interest so that they can properly backtrack to those rooms when the time comes. This ties directly into the last kind of room interaction, being management of inventory items. This means that the player makes use of one or more of the items in their inventory to pass a roadblock, which will either lead the player to the next room or will grant the player another item for their inventory. The flip side of this interaction is finding a new item, which can either be out in the open, obtained from an NPC, or given as a reward for solving a puzzle or using a previous inventory item. Overall, I would consider this aspect to be the shallowest of the three main types of interactions, but even so, finding a new item that can be used in an earlier room still rewards having thoroughly explored the room and paid attention prior, which ties in very well to the themes of the other types of interactions. The reason I go so in-depth with this is because I feel that a number of players, my younger self included, just really don't understand the connection between the second phase of collecting cookies and the third phase of room interaction. The slow pace of collecting cookies is necessary to help the player learn how a room works, which is then rewarded when a player is able to figure out a puzzle without any outside help. I know that the review I mentioned earlier made a big point out of never being able to figure out where to go, but I assure you that this is just plain not true. If the narrator or characters don't give you an indication, then the game always makes sure that the player can figure it out based on context clues gathered alongside the cookies. You're never sure on what to do because the game is never clear on what to do. Oftentimes, the narrator will give you hints on what needs to be done, but the hints are never straightforward. Okay, but can I maybe have a hint on where that key goes? Who'd have thought that this game would require a little bit of thinking to complete? It's almost like this game isn't as dumb as you're trying to make it out to be. Now, all that said, there is one exception to this rule of room progression, and that is Rabbit Stream. Man, I don't know what's up with this stream between the lacking aesthetic, the lack of proper level design, and whatever's wrong with this bird here, but I feel very strongly that Rabbit Stream was rushed, and that gives it a very unpolished feeling. There are a few points in the stream that I found myself genuinely unsure of where to go next, and the game's clues just don't to help here. That said, wandering around for a minute or two will usually lead you to all of your current dead ends, and points of interest are always marked with these pink sparkles, so I never found myself too incredibly lost. There is one other point I'd like to bring up about room progression before I move on to the first phase we skipped, and that's Ticker's Dream. Ticker's Dream is the last dream in the game, and it's kind of massive. Getting from one end to the other takes just a bit too long, and you'll have to do quite a bit of backtracking to complete this dream. Not helping is the fact that this loop in the middle is one way only, meaning if you need to go from here to here, you've got a lot of running around to do. 
Oh, come on! This could have been alleviated by having some kind of limited warping system, like perhaps a portal in the middle or at the edge of each season that allows you to jump between the other seasons. It's not a deal breaker, but it does drag down what is otherwise a clever and fun level. Altogether, I think the second and third phase of room progression work very well together to help the game's atmosphere set in. The slower pacing of level design really does a good job in helping to put the player in Piglet's shoes, since the Hundred Acre Wood is known for its soft, quiet vibes. Nothing's ever high stakes, and every day is a pleasant new adventure that can be fully absorbed at one's preferred pace. I'm not leaving out any important details right? Well, anyone who's played this game before knows for a fact that I am. As you may recall, I did say I was skipping over the first phase of room progression for a short while, but I think it's time we revisited it. This phase is different from the others in that it's less common and doesn't appear in every room. Now, you might be wondering why I haven't said what this first phase is yet. Given the slow-paced, kid-friendly nature of Piglet's Big Game thus far, the remaining phase may come as a bit of a shocker, and that phase is... Early on in the game's first level, the player is tasked with entering a previously sealed off room. Shortly before entering, they are given this cryptic warning by Pooh. Oh, and also Piglet, you know there may be half lumps in there. Of course, this doesn't seem like a big deal at the time. After all, most games have some kind of enemies or combat in them, and Heffalumps and Woozles make sense given their origins in Winnie the Pooh. So, like most players, you pass through this dark entrance and... Good lord, that's oddly terrifying! From the dark lighting to the low angles, to the way the controller and the whole screen shakes, everything about this entrance is handled perfectly. I think the cleverest part about this introduction to the Heflumps is that when control is finally given back to the player, the Heflump is actually facing away from them. And so, a daring player might try to rush down, assaulting the elephant with Piglet's little shin kick from earlier. And... Fucking hell! Okay, so a direct assault is out of the question. What the player is actually supposed to do is meet the Heffalump head on, ideally with a decent amount of space between Piglet and the Heffalump. And since the Heffalump is facing away from the player, that means that either the player will have to wait in place for the Heffalump to come the other way around the room, or the player will have to venture the other way to meet up with the Heffalump. Either way is scary, since the room cleverly doesn't let you see its entire layout at once. You only have a vague idea where the Heffalump is in 3D space, and the intensity of the music only kicks up the feeling of dread. Once the player makes eye contact with their enemy, they can press a button to enter what's known as Grimace mode. The player is warped into this existential void and can only sit there helplessly as their foe slowly marches in on them. The music here is very subtle, but does a good job of building up anxiety as you watch your doom slowly creep up behind you. At the bottom of the screen rests a series of randomly assigned button prompts, which we'll refer to as the sequence. For properly entering all the buttons in the sequence in order, Piglet will turn around and show off a brave face, which he can use to frighten away the Heffalump. Or turn them into a potion? Collecting the potion removes the enemy from gameplay, and failing to do so will allow the enemy to respawn. It can sometimes be tricky to pick up a potion if there are other enemies around to guard it, but some clever position can be used to reach it without issue. Enemies in this game can require inputting up to three sequences to defeat them, with subtle animation differences telling you how many hits the enemy has left. I wish that this was indicated a little more clearly, but at the same time, the unknown value of the enemy's health only adds to the fear factor. Should an enemy reach the player before the health is depleted? Good. God, I hate that. As the player progresses, they'll encounter Heflums and Woozles who won't react to their current brave face. That's what this box is for, known as a brave face machine. For a certain number of cookies, Piglet can watch... a creepy hand puppet version of himself performing a new brave face. After viewing this terrifying puppet show, Piglet can now perform this brave face, allowing him to defeat tougher enemies. More powerful brave faces require more complex inputs, with the final one requiring five inputs of simultaneous button and arrow key presses. As for these new brave faces... <laughs> Yeah, they're just about as strange and disturbing as you'd expect. If at any point the player feels that they won't be able to complete the inputs in time, they may press the same button they used to enter Grimace mode to bail out. The player will return to the real world, or dream world, with the Heflump or Woozle now significantly closer to them, but now they have a chance to reposition themselves and try again. Throughout the course of the game, the enemies don't simply get tougher, but more complex as well. Part of the strength of this combat engine is how new enemies are introduced who can completely mix up the way Grimace mode works. It's usually not too hard to beat them, but the fact that they can just change the rules on you means that on a first playthrough, having to quickly adapt to a new scenario only makes the sense of anxiety stronger. The two most common enemies are the basic Heflump and the basic Woozle, and yes, that's actually what they're called. As far as I can tell, there's not much of a gameplay difference 
difference between the two, so they mostly serve just as some visual flair to shake things up. Early on, the player is introduced to the B Heffalump, and fuck these things. They move incredibly fast, both on the overworld and in Grimace mode. This makes it very hard to position yourself relative to them, and even harder to get away when you need to bail. Note I said when and not if, because you will. Even with a lot of distance between the two of you, it's quite difficult to defeat them before they reach you. The tuba Heffalump has a pretty cool gimmick, and that's that if you take too long to enter the sequence, they'll actually shatter it once with toot from their horns, causing you to have to start over with a new sequence. I really love the face these guys make when you hit them. He always looks like he's been caught completely off guard. Eat. Get. A similar gimmick appears with the Road Sweeper Heffalump, who gives you a quick second look at the sequence before he obstructs it with a cloud of dust he kicks up. And for the last Heffalump variation, we have these assholes. I hate these things. This is the Jackpot Heffalump, and he fucking sucks. First off, his noises are terrifying! <laughs> From the classic mechanical groan sound that I hate, to this oddly human sounding scream. I've just always found these things really disturbing. Second, fuck his gimmick. The jackpot heffalump will randomly obstruct one or more of the buttons in your sequence right as it's given to you, causing you to have to guess either the directional key or the face button. I much prefer when it's the face button, since there's only three options as opposed to four, but either way, this one feels a little like bullshit to me. But no, there is no glitch that causes an obstructed face button to be the same as your bail button, despite what you may have heard in one specific video. This is the last time I'm going to mention this other review, but I really can't let this one go. This reviewer claims that there is a bug in the game that causes one of the obstructed buttons to actually be the bail button, either the X button on PS2 or the A button on GameCube. This, of course, would result in the player bailing the fight and having to start over. Well, after having done a few dozen playthroughs on both PS2 and GameCube, and after seeing several comments from people asking if this glitch was real since they've never encountered it for themselves, I've come to the conclusion that this reviewer is just full of shit. I've found absolutely zero evidence of this ever occurring for anyone else, and given how this review is constantly going out of its way to make Piglet's big game look bad, I wouldn't put it past the reviewer to have completely fabricated this glitch as just another way to shit on the game. If you want to give him the benefit of the doubt, I guess you could argue that since he was using the analog stick instead of the d-pad that perhaps he simply made an error in holding the stick in the wrong direction causing the sequence to fail, but either way, there is no glitch regarding this enemy's gimmick that I've seen evidence of. Over on the woozle side of things, we've got a few more enemy varieties. This creepy vampire is called the hide and seek woozle, who will hide in his cape, making him temporarily immune to your brave faces. I just adore the sounds this guy makes, they always crack me up. Then there's the mirror woozle, or as I usually call him, the sassy gay woozle, who has a really clever gimmick of rotating your screen around, making the d-pad inputs really tricky to keep up with. And finally, there's the sporty woozle, whose cool gimmick is changing the buttons in your sequence as you input it. There's one downside to the sporty woozle though, and that's that he moves painfully slow. These guys are hardly ever a threat because of how slowly they move, but while taking notes for this game, I was actually struck with a short burst of genius on how to fix this. On their own, most of these gimmicks are cute, but nothing too hard. Now, imagine if there was a way to take on multiple enemies at once. Instead of just one, you could have two or even three enemies marching along together. The player would have to quickly input a sequence to stop the approach of a bee heffalump while also having to deal with the sassy gay woozle's screen rotation. Or perhaps the player would have to guess the jackpot heffalump's button quickly so that the tuba heffalump doesn't shatter their progress. I think this could have made for some very interesting, heart-pounding combat scenarios, and it's kind of a shame that this game doesn't do anything like that. Modders, get to work making this a reality. There are two more types of enemies, both of which work differently in that they don't move at all. One of these is the tree monster, who only appears twice, and I'm not really sure what the point of it is. He just kind of sits there until you attack him with one of your terrifying brave faces. I almost feel bad for it, the helpless bloke. Almost. The second one is this door doing a Tim Curry impression. You don't give up, do you? His character is a lot of fun, and he acts as the guard for the battle arenas at the end of the second, fourth, and sixth dreams. Basically, since you're unable to leave those battle arenas after entering, he's just there to make sure that you've got the most powerful brave face you can currently have. If you've already got it, you scare him away and can progress. If not... My god, what's wrong with this game? Now that we have a better understanding of the tone that this game is shooting for, let's talk a little bit more about how everything comes together. At the beginning of the game, the slower pacing of the rooms helps to establish a very laid-back, pleasant vibe. This has helped you feel relaxed and at home among the denizens of the Hundred Acre Woods. Then, within mere seconds, the game shatters all of that, replacing it with horror, anxiety. From this point forwards, it's hard to feel relaxed in this game. With all the dim lighting, the dark, dreary colors, the foreboding sounds, and the creepy imagery, you find yourself always just a little bit on edge. Around any corner could be a horror. 
horror, and even rooms previously cleared aren't safe. Returning to them, you never quite know who will be ready to jump out at you. What lies ahead is always uncertain. Environments have this strange mystique to them. Things aren't what they seem at first glance, and the familiar laws of physics need not apply. Even areas previously cleared out offer no comfort, instead replacing what should be relaxing, calming sounds with this disturbing ambience. It is through all of this atmosphere that the game achieves its ultimate goal, to make the player feel like and understand Piglet, a character who's always anxious and afraid, even in a familiar, calm environment. And for that, this game is genius. It really goes out of its way to put you in the shoes of the pig. Throughout this whole adventure, the player can never quite rest easy. Even when a dream has been cleared, returning to it fails to provide any sort of comfort. There's a brief but difficult challenge where Piglet has to catch a variety of enemies in the room using the chase AI on a very strict time limit. And after that, the player is just sort of left there alone, wandering around an empty dream world. There's no music, no other characters, nothing but Piglet and the echoes of his footsteps. It's unsettling. Even in victory, everything seems so hollow and unfriendly. Was any of this intentional? Were the developers over at Doki Denke really artistic geniuses? Or were they simply programmers who had never heard of Winnie the Pooh, looked up the Heffel and Woozle scene so they could design enemies for this game, and said, oh, Winnie the Pooh isn't a cutesy heartwarming series, it's a trippy horror franchise designed to psychologically torment children, and then made this entire game with that mindset? I really can't say either way, but I suppose either explanation is possible. <laughs> There are a few final points I'd like to address before I bring this video to a close. The first of these are the segments where the player assumes control of Tigger and Pooh. While playing as Tigger, the game becomes heavily stealth oriented, with enemies having a line of sight displayed on screen as the player sneaks by. Pooh's gameplay is best described as traumatizing, as every enemy books it for you at full speed, and they always know exactly where you are. You're often left navigating mazes as the enemies attempt to hunt you down and corner you. Both Pooh and Tigger are completely defenseless and unable to confront enemies with brave faces like the pig can. Another detail I've always liked is Piglet's progression throughout the game. He goes from being afraid, to being determined, to being confident when it comes to facing his enemies. By the end of the game, he's the only one who isn't cowering in fear, showing his transformation from a timid animal into kind of a badass. This is only furthered by this game's sequel, Pooh's Rumbly Tumbly Adventure, where Piglet is actually excited to engage in combat. Oh, I'll help you clear the path. Everyone, run. Now. Piglet's had a taste for blood, and he wants more. Oh, I should probably talk about this game's final level. After completing all six dreams, the player unlocks the seventh option, which is to infiltrate the dreams of this boat? Actually, the boat just represents the final area, which takes place in the real world. After clearing the final dream, Piglet finds himself back in the Hundred Acre Woods, which has now become flooded. His friends are all stranded, and this time, the half and some woozles are real. This time, the monsters are real. The player is thrown onto this small island, where Pooh, Roo, and Owl are trapped around them. Also on this island are the items they had lost and you retrieved in their dreams, being Pooh's honeypot, Roo's ball, and Owl's memory book. I like you have to use their items to get to them. Each character is trapped with an enemy approaching them. If you fail to take out the enemies in time, it's honestly not really that scary here without the trans-dimensional void, but what is scary is your time limit. This section is probably the single strictest time limit I've seen in any game, worse than any of the Master Thief sprints. You just barely have enough time to complete this segment, which gets your heart rate up quick. Not helping is the fact that Rue is cornered by a bee heflump, who are bad enough to defeat in a regular arena, but in this narrow space, you just can't get any real distance between yourself and the bee heflump, making it almost impossible to hit once, let alone three times. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I'm really not a fan of this final level. It's super frustrating, and one little slip out can be enough to send you back to the start of it all. For saving each character, you get a quick cutscene of them, accompanied by a significantly less disturbing version of a music theme that you heard prior in their dream. I really like this detail, it's both adorable and sweet. For saving all three of them, you get to move on to the next segment, and this one features Eeyore, Rabbit, and Tigger, who need to be saved using a paintbrush, a carrot, and a plank of wood? These three items don't work as well as the first three thematically, but I appreciate the effort. Rabbit's actually cornered by two enemies, which is a nice change of pace, and Tigger is... what the fuck? I fell through the floor? As far as I can tell, this glitch only happens in the GameCube version, but it really sucks. It's triggered by attempting to rescue Tigger first, so it's easy to avoid, but it feels awful just to be stuck under the floor, waiting for the time limit to run out. Luckily, the time limit is much more forgiving in this segment, although it doesn't mean you have to wait down here under the level for significantly longer if you do trigger the glitch. For clearing both of those, you find yourself in the third and final phase, face to face with the mastermind behind it all. That weird smoke thing from the opening cutscene. What was it called again? The Granosaurus? Oh, gra oh, 
Yes. Alrighty. The Grandosaurus is what was invading everyone's dreams, spreading around its heflums and woozles, harnessing power from their fear to manifest its creatures in the real world. At least, that's what I assume, since the game really doesn't tell you anything. Also, this final fight here is a joke. You just hit it three times, that's it. It's like the slowest enemy in the game, and given everything that we were just through in the first phase of this final level, it feels downright pathetic. With the Grandosaurus out of the way, peace has been restored in the Hundred Acre Woods. Christopher Robin just shows up out of nowhere, and thanks Piglet for his bravery in saving us friends from the flood. Piglet now presumably uses his brave faces to conquer the Hundred Acre Woods, traumatizing anyone who dare oppose him and rebuilding it as an empire in his image, murdering elephants as he sees fit, all while planning his next strike as he plots to take over the world. And that's kind of it. That was Piglet's big game. I certainly wouldn't say that this is the greatest game I've ever played, but as far as licensed games go, there's not too much better out there. What Piglet may lack in complexity, it more than makes up for in its clever level structure used to convey atmosphere. It makes the whole game a unique, charming experience that's fairly hard to forget. The only way I can really describe this game is as a hidden gem, and it's the standard that I hold most games aimed at a young audience to. Also, I think it just goes to show that low-budget kids games from no-name devs can be decent too. It's amazing how if a developer really tries, they can make gems like this, and if they don't, they can make pets cats too. If you haven't played this game, I'd recommend checking it out for yourself. It's certainly worth a playthrough, just uh, maybe be careful sharing this game with young children, unless you really want to traumatize them or something. Real quick before we end off this episode, I'd like you to take the time to vote on the poll I have set up in the upper right hand corner. I want to know if you ever played this game as a kid, and if so, did it traumatize you? Thank you all so much for watching this video through to the end. If you liked what you saw, feel free to leave a comment down below telling me what you liked, or just to elaborate on your poll answer. If you'd like to see more, you can click the subscribe button down below and ring the little ringy bell right next to it in order to get notified when I upload new videos. I'm hopefully going to get one of these out before the end of the next month, so with any luck, the wait between this video and the next one won't be quite as long. But in the meantime, I got some gaming content to help carry you over, so why don't you go check some of that out. Thank you all so much for watching. This has been Fabulous Fish, and I hope to see you in my next video.